You're listening to Artistic Finance, show 121. On today's show, I chat with multidisciplinary designer Amy D. Lux. We talk about index funds, credit scores, compound interest, how late bloomers can retire early, tools for budgeting and investing, using a debt avalanche to pay off debt, FIRE, financial independence retire early, and loan rehabilitation, which is how to get your student loan out of default. Today's episode is a bit longer than normal, and that's because Amy was throwing out oodles of great ideas and financial tools. Because of that long interview, I don't have any takeaways at the end of the show, but trust me, you'll have a lot of takeaways of your own. Amy and I do chat quite a bit of lighting because that's our background. Normally, I would put that part of the conversation over on Patreon. However, it was integral to the financial discussion. But if you only want to hear the financial part of the conversation, jump to minute 33. And if you think you're too old to turn your financial life around and become financially independent, jump to minute 59. Now, this is the best pitch for older people to improve their finances that I've ever heard. So even if you aren't interested in listening to lighting designers talk, skip to the part where Amy goes into financial independence retire early mode and gives a realistic timeline on how long it takes to get retirement on track. Today will be my last time mentioning LDI for the year. Our live recording will take place this Friday, November 18th in Las Vegas. Meet up with Amy and me and Marcia Stern and Jen Schriever. We're all going to talk finances from a freelance perspective. Now that's 11.30 a.m. this Friday with a special thanks to our LDI partner, Ayrton. Without further ado, let's get to the show. You're listening to Artistic Finance Podcast, where your host, Ethan Steimel, interviews successful artists, leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire artists to grow their wealth. Welcome and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Ethan Steimel, and I'm joined today by our guest, multidisciplinary designer, Amy D. Lux. So thanks for joining us, Amy. Thanks. It's so great to be here. Bear with me before we talk about finance. I just want to do some news updates because I haven't done this for a while. And so anybody who wants to get to the financial part of our discussion, just jump ahead 10 minutes. So I'm going to start with the heaviest news and then I'll move on to happier. But Iran is in the news a lot. For people listening in the future who don't know this, about a month ago, there was a 22-year-old, Masa Amina, who was arrested by the police and killed for identifying as a female gender and not wearing a headscarf. And so Iran's law requires that females must wear headscarves in public. And so in this situation, the punishment for that was death. And of course, people in Iran became outraged about this. Now we're about six weeks later. And according to the BBC, 222 people have died in the protests, and most of those are coming at the hands of the police by beating or being shot. Especially there was a a big move on September 30th and where the police opened fire on a crowd and they killed 40 people that day. Something unprecedented about this protest is that there's a lot of high school students and even younger that are going out in the streets that are burning their headscarves. But that means a lot of them have been killed. (laughs) So of that 222, there's as young as 12, 13. um, There's some 14-year-olds. There's a a number, like a half a dozen of 16-year-olds that have been killed. And then the oldest that's been killed so far is age 62. So the Internet's being stopped. It's being slowed down. It's being stopped a lot. And 24 journalists have been arrested this past weekend in Berlin, so this is this is spreading to a global protest. And in Berlin, there's some amazing, uh, let's see, over overhead eagle's eye view shots of um, people coming out in protest. And there was twenty four thousand people in Berlin this weekend. It's sort of amazing the the impact this is all having. And then also another thing is that a lot of people are saying, well, this isn't Iran. We're clarifying that it's the Islamic Republic of Iran. So why do I bring this all up? It's just amazing to see how much power that people have. And unfortunately, it's coming at the cost of lives. But to see the global outrage go in sync with the Iran national outrage is sort of powerful. And so we'll see how this all shakes out. But it's really great to see so many people being so brave to bring change to oppressive rules and regulations. 
because I'm going to be honest, Amy, I don't think I would be brave enough to do some of the protesting that people in Iran are doing. Yeah, they're incredible. Um, okay, so now financial news here in the U.S. <laughs> go go from that to this. Um, 2023, because of inflation, the IRS is uh, changing the reti- amounts of money that you can save in retirement accounts. So the IRA limits for this year are 6000 but next year they're going to be 6500 Simple retirement plans are going up to 15500 which this year was 14000 Lap Chi Chu, who was a guest on our podcast, we know that he has a simple plan. So we'll have to let him know that it's going up by $1,500 <laughs> or that he's allowed to set aside. People with 403B, 457, 401ks, and anybody in the thrift savings plan, which is the federal government sort of retirement plan, they're allowed to set aside $22,500 as opposed to this year, which was $20,000. Um, and then catch up contributions. If you are 50 or older, for everybody in the thrift saving plan, the 403B, you are allowed to add an additional 7,500, whereas this year that was 6,500. And then people on simple plans, if you're 50 and older, you can add 3,500 extra as opposed to 3,000 this year. The Roth limit phase out. So if you make so much money, you can't contribute to a Roth retirement account, which Roth accounts are just the same as the regular ones, only you can't deduct the taxes. But in retirement, when you pull the money out, you're not being taxed on it. More of the story is if you make too much money, they don't let you do that. Like you're going to have to pay the taxes in the future. But anyway, so those limits are going up, but it's sort of complicated. And I was looking on the IRS website and I actually saw that these limits only apply if you have access to a workplace retirement plan. So what I'm hearing there is if you're a freelancer, let's just say you're a freelancer and you make $300,000 you can actually still contribute to a Roth if you don't have access to a workplace plan. Now, if you're in a union, like a lot of our listeners are probably in a union, that means you have access to a plan. So even if you're not vested or you're not using it, these limitations apply. But anyway, if this is of concern to you, <laughs> you can go to the IRS website and check, check the limits because it's, it's going up. So now you can make a little bit more and still be able to use a Roth if you want. Okay, but also don't listen to me. Ignore everything I've just said because we're going to have CPA Elton Lalage on the show next week. He is going to talk about retirement plans for freelancers. So check back there and get the actual facts from a CPA. (laughs) Okay, and Amy, finally, the last thing I want to talk about, which is the buzz on Broadway, and that is actor Sarah Porkalob, who is in 1776 right now. She gave an interview in Vulture, and she was explaining about the racial binary issues that are in the show, which, of course, got everybody on the defensive because anybody in the arts or entertainment does not want to be even remotely accused of being racist, even though it's baked into our ecosystem. But the thing I took away from the backlash that's been happening is the fact that she explained why she took the job in 1776, and... She said that she took it so she could get a Tony nomination, more Instagram followers, and then she added that she only gives 75% of herself to the performance, (laughs) which she's gotten a lot of pushback. Amy, I'm going to want your opinion on this because I appreciate Sarah's candor very much because I think that a lot of times in the arts, we identify so much with our work. There is this like unspeakable bond that we all share because of how much time and energy we're putting into all this. A lot of times we call it like a vocation or a calling, or we say like, it chooses us, I didn't choose it. (laughs) And we say things like that because we need a rational explanation to the rest of the world on like why we work so much or why we're doing something without a guarantee of financial compensation or sacrificing things in our personal life. And so somehow we say, oh, it's a calling. That makes it all okay. And then people go, oh, yeah, that's one of those crazy artist people. But I don't think we necessarily need to do that because it really is a job. Like, we all have to make money. There's nothing wrong with that. And especially if we want a decent wage, we have to switch to something like commercial theater or commercial art or trade shows or architecture or or something. You have to go that route. Case in point for, for me, like this week, I'm off doing a little off. It's a hole in the wall theater here in New York. It's called The Chain. A hole in the wall theater. The lights are 50 years old. The lighting board is an ETC Express, which is 25 years old. 
which Amy, you said that was your first lighting console. <laughs> yeah. It's the first one I remember playing with and like having my own show with. Oh my gosh. And this is one I've never actually used, I don't think. It has like all the faders. It has like yeah. 48 faders. Nice. And a floppy <laughs> disk. Yesterday I had to save yeah. the show to the floppy. And you have to go into the disk settings and like write the show. And then it takes like... Uh, 45 seconds to write the show to the disc. Make sure that floppy disk does a good hot. <laughs> <laughs> but that show, I am not giving 100% to. And the reality is like, it's a small theater. I have six areas of front light, six areas of no color top light, and six like and some high sides that are not great coverage. No one is expecting me to give 100% because <laughs> like it is what it is. Like no matter how much of myself I put in or identify with that show, I can only do so much with that lighting. And Amy, I'm going to be honest. The reason why I'm doing this hole in the wall show is that maybe one day it'll go to Broadway. That's a laugh. (laughs) (laughs) And it might give me more Instagram followers, maybe. Um, But I'm definitely only giving 75%. It's just unrealistic for us to sort of like live, breathe and die our art or our job. And I feel like that's becoming more and more of a thing where people are like, oh, yeah, we have to take care of the me, like not the artist me, not the worker be me, not the humanoid me but like me, and that's more important. Because another thing that's like going on right now is I'm a lighting director over at Bloomberg Television this week, which is a full-time job. (laughs) And then I'm also the associate lighting designer for the Yiddish Fiddler, which is loading into New World Stages next week. So I'm working on that. And I have a show called Dreamland coming up that is at Missouri State University. And then, of course, the week after that, we have LDI. You'll be at, and I'll be at... (laughs) But I have to prep for that. Plus, we're recording this podcast and I'm putting out these podcast episodes. So all I'm saying is that I am totally on Sarah Porkolov's side when it comes to not giving all of yourself because like, you only have 100% of your life. And how much do you want your work, your job to be a part of that? So anyway, there are no sides, but I applaud Sarah Porkolov. I do too. I think, you know, I'm coming fresh out of burnout right now, so... Um, you know, I've had to kind of like step back and, and take a breath. And I think a lot of people through the past few years, we've just been through a lot of collective trauma. People are reevaluating what's important and what we need to give attention to and what we haven't been giving attention to. I agree with her. I think we all need to have balance and we're in a real um, workaholic productivity. You know, everything is your job and it's you work, live and breathe it. And whether it's artistic or not, you know, I think every industry is going through this. The best thing we can do for, for not just for ourselves, but for each other is self care and, and taking that time for other things that are valuable in your life so that we can, when we are present, even if it's not a hundred percent of our time, we are giving a, a better product of ourselves because we've rested and we've spent time with fam- family and friends and we've took time to read and whatever it is, we, we need to balance it out. And we haven't been doing a great job as a society. So I think that that's all kind of coming to a head. And, and people uh, like Sarah are, are, you know, finally just speaking up about it and making it a little less taboo. Again, I love it when other people say things that I'm thinking, but I'm not brave enough to say them. <laughs> so I'm like, good, good, good. I think we'll also touch base on this again, because um, I have a question later about giving and charity and stuff like that. And I think we'll circle back to this. But before we go into the financial discussion today, let's talk about LDI, because you're going, I'm going. And believe it or not, not all our listeners know what LDI is, because not all of them go. So could you just tell us what it is? Yeah, so it's um, Lighting Design International, I think, right? I haven't looked at the the naming, uh, the what it stands for in a long time, but I believe it's Lighting Design International. And it's the the U.S. annual lighting conference that happens every year in Vegas. All of the manufacturers come out and show off all their new goodies, all of the lighting designers, production designers, anybody that's in the lighting industry, predominantly entertainment, but some architectural lighting as well, and see all the new lighting toys. And I always go like just for the weekend, but there's so much training And like one of these times, I'm going to go like at the beginning of the week and do some of the week long training. Yeah, they always have top notch presenters, educators, trainers. Um, It's really worth it. I've taken a few and just really top level training there. Okay, so you're running a session. What session is that? 
Um, I'm in the, the Women in Lighting panel. I think that's on Friday at 3.30. Correct me if I'm wrong. 100% correct. I'm, go- I'm going to be there. I'll see you there. <laughs> yeah, so this is a panel that was put on by um, Women in Lighting, and there's actually three women on the panel, um, and we're going to be doing different segments. My segment is based on considerations in the built environment because um, I'm one of the enigmas that has an entertainment background but transitioned into architectural. So I love to help people kind of understand what's required to make that that transition. Okay, yeah. And then Artistic Finance is recording a live episode. That's going to be on that same Friday, but at 1130 in the morning. We're competing with the portfolio review and, again, all that good training. So we got a lot of competition, but it's going to be a great recording. This year, Artistic Finance has a sponsor at LDI. We're partnering with Ayrton. And Ayrton is actually a big supporter of Women in Lighting, and that's why I'm attending the panel and why I'm now getting involved in Women in Lighting, <laughs> because Ayr- Ayrton, Ayrton made me. I mean, suggested that I do that. <laughs> so, so now, Amy, let's talk about you and your life. First question, is your actual name Lux? It is. <laughs> I just assumed this was like a stage name. Um, I mean, it is my name. It is my legal name. And my middle initial is D. So my nickname is Deluxe. But there was a name change when I was when I was older. I have a, a sad childhood. And I was thinking that I would change my name when I was older, when I got married. And then I decided to take it into my own hands and not wait for that because I am a progressive forward thinking feminist. And I uh, went down to the courthouse and updated my name. I already had the name. De- I already had the nickname Deluxe. I already had my business name Lobo Lux. And so it was just kind of a, you know, a natural progression. And I just legalized it. I wasn't born with the name. I thought so. I just wanted to clarify, because if anybody doesn't know, a Lux is a measure, a measurement of light intensity. I have learned that it is a it is a rare, but it is a real last name. I met someone from the sheriff's office of Nevada the other day, and he said that they have uh, an officer in their division with the last name Lux and asked if I was related. And I also found a crest, I think, with origins in the UK, if I recall correctly. It actually is a genuine last name, about about rare, Um, not one that I was born with, um, but that I adopted. (laughs) I just love it. I was like, talk about a lighting nerd. Oh, my gosh. Right. (laughs) I mean, I can go off about light because I, not only do I love it in the industry, but I also love just the in, all of the symbolism of light and the fact that our entire perception is based on shadow and light just for being human, right? And how environments change based on how much light we have or don't have. So kind of, yeah, a little bit obsessed with the concept. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. All right, Amy Deluxe, real name. All right, so... Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, just a little bit of your background? Yeah. So i um, originally born in Philadelphia and uh, was always a visual artist, always leaned towards visual arts. Um, got, I actually got my degree in graphic design originally and then moved to Austin. Austin was a sleepy town still back then. And we also had just um, been coming out of uh, the aftermath of 9-11. And so there just wasn't a lot of opportunity for me to get like a grown up job and get, you know, with graphic design. And so I was just kind of freelancing, making um, flyers and CD covers for bands and things in Austin and um, doing coffee shop shows, you know, with my paintings and things. And somebody um, said that I could pick up some work doing staging. And so I started off just doing that as like a side hustle and uh, naturally went into like props and set painting and, you know, as a carpenter, because everybody starts as a carpenter. Um, but the props and the set painting made sense with my visual art background. But I was just very intrigued by the lighting. And so I asked to be on the lighting crew and it was just completely enamored. And for me, I'm kind of even brained. So if I go too far down the creative, I crave structure. And if I go too far down the structure, I crave creative. And so the lighting kind of satisfied both of those. And then I just went and did a whole bunch of certifications and things to kind of like catch up and educate myself in that area because I knew I wanted to pursue it. And um, yeah, and then it just kind of took off from there. That's awesome. Also, that's interesting about the being even, you know, organized and disorganized. 
all at once or structured and unstructured. <laughs> yeah, I still think I'm, I, I actually, it's funny that you said it that way because I feel very organized, but whenever I have an art studio, I've always struggled with this because I have to have a separate space for my art studio because I'm a very messy artist, but I'm a very clean person. So I could never have like a table in my kitchen or my bedroom that had my art stuff going on because I, I have to leave that stuff out and you know, like you're in the zone and you don't want to like, you want to come back to it. You don't want to put all your paints away and, you know, put everything back away. Cause you've got to stay in that zone. So I've oh, it's funny. So I guess maybe I am disorganized when it comes to visual art. Um, but everything else is always very, very organized. Well, I'll speak to your organization because this is episode 120, which means we've done 120 of these. And I send everybody an outline ahead of time, a Google Doc, and it has the questions we're going to ask. And I say, feel free to add in notes or make changes or comments. You're the first person <laughs> to ever like comment on things and clarify. That's how I knew your first console was an express console. <laughs> <laughs> Taking a break from our interview to mention our Patreon page. Now the show is free and that's intentional. And we provide a space where any artist can ask any financial question and we'll get them an answer. Now there's no fear of shame, stigma, or guilt. And providing that free of charge is important. But there are ongoing costs to keep the show going, and those costs are offset by you, our patrons. So if you're enjoying the show, please consider supporting us on Patreon. In addition to supporting artistic finance, part of our mission is to give back to the entertainment industry. And we do that by supporting more than 30 artists and arts nonprofits with monthly contributions. If you want to join us in this work, please sign up at patreon.com slash artistic finance. I also want to take a minute to mention ACT Entertainment. ACT is the sole rep of Ayrton in North America, and they're going to be showcasing the Ayrton gear at LDI. They're also coordinating the Women in Entertainment Lighting session. We're working with Ryan at ACT Entertainment, who sent us this message. ACT Entertainment is proud to support Ayrton's goal to raise awareness of the Women in Lighting organization and expand their global network across the entertainment lighting industry. Please visit us at our LDI booth number 1223 to pick up a free drink ticket for the Women in Lighting reception we are hosting at the LDI Circle Bar from 5 to 6 p.m. Friday the 18th, immediately after the Women in Lighting panel. See you there. And now, back to the show. Also now, what do you do for money? Or like, what is your career path? Yeah, so it's funny because when I was doing graphic design, I was terrible at freelancing. And I did, I did a lot of things just literally for free. I mean, I was like the free and freelancing. Um, but so when I pivoted over to doing stagecraft, you know, I was a freelancer, but there was just, there's already kind of some organization in, in place with that. And so I kind of was freelancing for a long time, um, I think like 10 or 11 years. And then um, got a little older and um, realized that I hadn't saved any money, didn't have any retirement accounts, was getting a little bit you know, tired and was just like, how long am I going to be able to do physical labor You know, at the hardcore state that I was doing it at the time? And so um, I decided to do some full-time work, naively thought that I could just do it for like two or three years while I get my ducks in a row you know, took some full-time work and became a nine to fiver, which was as an entrepreneur, always a struggle for me. Um, but I had really great opportunities and I learned a lot. So I kept going with it. Um, and this is really where I kind of did more deep diving into more traditional architectural um, and permanent installation. After doing full-time work for six years, um, I just recently decided to go back to the entrepreneur path and I'm three months into freelancing again, but I've actually expanded my services. So not only do I do lighting and systems design, I'm very strong in controls. So on the architectural side, um, I do trainings for that. I uh, teach specifiers about advanced controls, um, but I've also added graphic design back into my offerings because I make a lot of educational and training materials you know, because I have a graphic design degree, I understand that there's an, any anyone that does any kind of visual creation, lighting design or anything, we understand that there is 
a way to, there's a psychological impact for when people are absorbing visual content, color, balance, empty space. And so I roll these concepts into my educational materials and spec sheets and flyers and whatever it is. And because of that, I've been doing education alongside um, with the companies that I've worked full time for. I've been making a lot of educational content the entire time I've been full time. And I've just had a lot of feedback that uh, people are getting a lot more out of, whether it's a webinar, a presentation, I, AIA, uh, people are, have been receiving it very well. It's so fun for me that I just decided I'm going to, I know it's unusual, but I'm going to add it into my offerings because I'm very good at it and I enjoy it. And frankly, when I got into lighting design, you know, when I went from starting as a carpenter and doing props and I just liked lighting and I did a bunch of cert cert certifications to kind of catch up, the main reason I think that I succeeded in stepping stones up to being a lighting designer is because I had that graphic design education and I already understood color combinations and balancing things. And I just transferred the graphic design concepts into lighting design. Obviously there was a lot to learn with programming and moving lights and all of the, the, that technical stuff. But the graphic design basics that I had learned just transformed over very easily. Now I do a little bit of combination of that. And since I've been freelancing, ma the majority of what I've been doing um, the past couple of months is a lot of graphic design uh, website. i built a couple of websites, done some branding, sell sheets and things like that. And it's successful also because it's hard to find graphic designers or web developers that understand the lighting. So I can actually do all of my own, you know, I can get the graphics, I can write the copy, I don't need the copy to be provided. So, um, you know, in a way, there's like a lot of price discount happening, because it's more of an all in one package, because I understand the lighting and systems that go behind it. So you were on the light talk podcast, like a month ago. And I actually heard that and I knew I was going to love this conversation because I loved that one. So I was like, oh my gosh, I have to get Amy over here. <laughs> um, but you mentioned that you're now living the van life or soon to be living the van life. And you said you were going fully remote. And I was going to ask you how you were doing fully remote because I was thinking you were doing lighting or are, are you also doing that? Yeah, so I, it's both. So I, um, a lot of the lighting that I do, I do a lot of lighting systems design and consulting, and I can do that from anywhere. And if I do have to be on site or at a show, I can fly anywhere still, you know, so, or I can drive there in the van. So a lot of options. Okay, I'm going to ask a silly question. And I assure you, Amy, that I am a lighting designer. And I'm going to ask this question. Systems design. When you say I do system design, like, what is it that that means? Yeah, well, when I was doing lighting for entertainment, you know, a lot of times in smaller productions, especially uh, your lighting and your programming and everything kind of happens all at once. But when you start doing permanent installation, a, a few things happen. Um, for one thing, in architectural lighting, lighting and controls are totally different departments. And so a lot of times you'll have a specifier may not even be a lighting designer. The specifier may be an architect or maybe the electrical engineer, and they're just putting lighting onto the drawing, but they don't necessarily know what controls are needed. In architectural, the controls aren't just like the fun bling bling that we do in a theater production, but you also need occupancy sensors and photo cells, and maybe you need building management or demand response so that if there's a surge that the utility company can like lower the amount of energy that you're using. So there's all kinds of additional controls that go into architectural lighting. And so normally when I'm doing a system design, it's going to be for an architectural project that's going to uh, encompass a lot of different elements. If we're including dynamic or RGB or circadian lighting, obviously that's going to take, you know, its own set of rules as well. And so it's just kind of a combination of what do I need to happen to meet code? What do I need to happen to make sure there's general illumination? What do I need to happen to do RGB or to do circadian lighting that mimics the light of the sun? And all of those things have to work in tandem. Okay. I opened a Pandora's box there. Okay. I'll stop. I'll stop. <laughs> Basically <laughs> what I'm hearing is that I should go to your LDI talk and maybe I'll understand more. <laughs> also, I want to circle back to something you said, put the free in freelancing. 
Oh man, that is a phrase that we never want to hear again on this show. Yeah, I know. This is the first time hearing it and I never want to hear it again. <laughs> All right, anybody listening, banish that from your brain. Yes, yes. And then we learned how to not do that. So yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, the freaking freelancing. I mean, that's obviously like a big caveat with creative fields is it's challenging sometimes for people to charge what they should earn and um you know it'll it'll be on your portfolio you know that whole thing with when people are early in their career i'm sure everyone's kind of gone through that that phase getting started but you know we need to we need to survive and and be compensated for our work my advice no i don't give advice but if i were to give advice <laughs> to younger people it would be like don't do summer stock theater i think there's value in them blah 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 but i don't think it's value enough so I would say, like, go work for any lighting company, go f work for anybody else, almost get a regular job and like go volunteer at a theater, like on your evenings and weekends. But like, don't do the full time grind. Anyway, just my opinion, because it's basically you're putting the free and freelancing in those situations. Yeah, it's more it's almost like a like an internship. I did summer stock. That's where I did, worked on my express. <laughs> my first, like, I think that was my first uh, ME job. I did like five of them. Yeah. And just looking back, I'm like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I digress. I digress. Um, Amy, your creative personality here. What is a live event that you like to experience as an audience member? Or what is a piece of art that you like? I want to combine this question and create something that isn't in the world yet that I'd love to see. My favorite artist is Alphonse Mucha, uh, who was a uh, illustrator in um, from Czech Republic. He was actually one of the first people that was doing like what we would call graphic design today, but it was all hand illustrated. But you know, the job cigarettes girl, and uh, you know, he was combining gorgeous illustrations with font and text, but all hand illustrated and just, I love, it's Art Nouveau, you know, the curves of the lines and the thicknesses, just love his work. And he's been a huge influencer my entire life, just in my visual arts and my graphic design. And I was thinking, man, I would lose my mind if we did an immersive the way we've done with Van Gogh, but with Mucha's work, that would be, I would just live there. <laughs> Okay, this you were so prepared, so I actually went and looked up the work because I, I was like, I don't know who this is. And then the, the looks that he created are very iconic. So I was like, how many of these have I seen or how many imitations of these have I seen? Because there's, like there's a theater in St. Louis where I'm originally from um, called the Fox Theater, and it has these old-timey, like, I guess you call them cigarette rooms or smoking rooms, and they have like some of that art on the wall, and they have even some of it like, made out of glass. So it's like, it's that just iconic, like that everybody's seen these everywhere. Um, also, Amy, I'm thinking you're a bright human being. I'm a fairly bright human being. I know people that do projections and I have some skills and you have some skills. All we need is a room somewhere. We could totally do this. I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. All right. So we'll put a pin in that but everybody circle back for the immersive Alphonse Mucha coming to a city near you soon <laughs> or maybe it'll arrive in a van or like an 18 wheeler of like I a van life the Mucha. side of the van you could just like stand in front of it <laughs> amazing um, all right so now your financial personality are you good or bad with money i am excellent with money now i was very bad but i'm excellent now your website so i'll have all, links to all your socials and all your websites and everything in the show notes but really quickly, it's utopiadreamscape.com. That's the lifestyle one. That's the lifestyle one. So on your lifestyle website, you have a whole financial section. And I went and looked at it and I was like, oh my gosh, Amy should be hosting artistic finance. I have, <laughs> I have no business doing this. <laughs> but you have such good, like a lot of resources. Can we start there? Because how did that happen? Like, how did you get to that point? I, I want to bring it back to the conversation earlier we had about Sarah, because there was a point in my, for one thing in my, in my career where I was just like, I am just all lighting, like all I talk about, all I post about, like, I'm just, that's it. And I, and I started to miss some kind of other parts of my personality and persona that I wasn't pursuing anymore. And a lot of it was my visual art. I love writing. Um, you know, I love making graphic design. And all of that had been abandoned for a really long time. And so when I first made the Utopia Dreamscape website, it was um, really just for kind of this 
alternative creative expression that was, you know, something else that I do besides lighting, because it does include other things like nutrition and, you know, visual arts and other other things in that. That's why I call it a lifestyle website. There's other elements there. The finance piece of it started really when I was making that same transition where I went for the full time job for a few years um, because I realized that I was oh, I've always been financially responsible. I've always paid my rent and my bills on time. But I was doing typical American things like paying the minimum of the, you know, the school loan or the credit or the credit card balance and not not understanding compound interest and how much it was working against me. And at the end of the day, you know, I ended up owing a lot more on my school loans than I ever took out and just things like that. And I just was never I was just on the hamster wheel, just never getting ahead. And I started feeling tired. I'm you know, I'm getting older and realized that I didn't have any retirement savings. I didn't have any savings really any at all. And I decided the very first thing that happened, the first real trigger moment, I was driving on a road trip and I was listening to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I realized that I did not have my financial act together. I had no financial IQ. I had no idea where to begin, um, but I needed to get my act together or I was going to have a really tough time as an, as an elderly person. I, I thought that that book was going to be mm, finance 101. This is so boring. This is what money is. And I was very surprised that it was a narrative. It completely helped me sh start to shift my mindset. And I thought, OK, maybe I'll get into like getting some real estate so that I can have something to like fall back on. And I did that. I bought my first house in Austin in 2016 and I house hacked it, meaning that I had roommates and I lived there myself. Um, which helped me pay the mortgage and, you know, associated costs. And then I remodeled it and went over my remodel budget, took out a bunch of debt for that. So again, just like most Americans do, you like pay something off and then you take on more debt. So I was, I thought I was being frugal, but I wasn't really. I, I just, I just kept on repeating cycles. Then in 2018, another pivotal moment I discovered through a friend, the Afford Anything podcast by Paula Pant. She is part of the FIRE community and the FIRE community is, stands for Financial Independence Retire Early. And there are a lot of people in this space, but Paula Pant and Afford Anything was my first one. And what I loved about that podcast is that she explains things in you know very complicated topics, but in very easy to understand ways. She's very well spoken. And she would also take in calls from the audience and people would talk about their individual situations. So you could kind of imagine being in a similar situation and, and starting to hear the same language repeated. You know, I didn't know what a, an IRA was. I didn't know what index funds were, but you start to hear these stories and, over and over again. And then the vocabulary and the language starts to make sense. So it was with that that I realized that I had been doing that repetitive cycle where I'd pay something off and then I'd take on more debt. So I decided, and that was 2018, um, in the summer of 2018, I decided that I was going to pay off all of my consumer debt and not, not incur more debt, you know, as much as possible. I had, at the time, I mean, I had paid off, I had already paid off my school loans, finally, but I had that $30,000 of the remodel. I had 10,000 or so in credit card debt. I had a car loan. So I probably had like 40 or $50,000 of debt in the time, at the time. And I paid it off 2020, exactly two years later and became consumer debt free. And let me tell you, it's so liberating. And then from that time, I was able to take the money that I used to pay into debt and put that money into savings and retirement funds and property and other things. So really the, the way that I was able to do all that is by having a really hard look of my financial reality that nobody really wants to do. But I used mint.com and with mint.com, what I love about it, it's free. Anybody can use it. It correlates all of your different accounts. It took me several months to look at my budget and be like, there's no way I'm spending that much on this. You know, I started looking at categories and I was like, this cannot be right because I always thought I was frugal. When I started to realize what I was actually spending, I was traumatized. And so I've started finding ways to increase the gap between spending and saving. You know, anytime I stopped spending something, I would move that into savings. And 
what's great about the fire movement too, is it's not about restricting yourself. It's about realizing what you're doing subconsciously or unconsciously, and then removing and reevaluating those items to be putting money into the things that you really value. Like I really value travel. I'm always going to have a travel budget, but I don't value clothing. So I'm not going to buy a lot of clothes. It's just kind of when you see your budget and once you get real with your budget, you can start to understand what your real habits are and correct them. And people always think they, they, I don't make enough money. I don't have room for that. But when you really analyze and you're really looking at every transaction and becoming aware of every transaction, there's always, there's always room to move things around. Wow. This is a great story (laughs) and it's a great example of using mint very well and of analyzing your finances and your budget really well. And you're reminding me like actually like a couple years ago when I started this podcast, I stopped tracking on mint. (laughs) Well, actually I like switched over to personal capital and then I started the show. And I think, I don't know why, but like you're saying, I just assume I'm frugal. So I'm like, I'm good. I got this. And I like haven't logged in for a year. And so now you're reminding me that I will go and I will be traumatized just as you were traumatized. (laughs) (laughs) So that's amazing. So do you still, so this was 2018 when you signed up for Mint? I had Mint before that, but I wasn't optimizing it. I wasn't really getting in there in the budget. So 2018 was when I realized that I thought that I had these good habits. And then I, I realized that I wasn't as good as I thought. And so then I got really, that's when I got more serious with Mint and my budgeting. Because this is also serendipitous because just this morning, a patron messaged me and said, hey, I finally signed up for Mint. They said, well, there's not really a place for Patreon. So you're a gym membership in my Mint account. (laughs) That's funny. They also said they didn't like it because of the logging in situation. They said they have some accounts that like they still have to go in and like log into those accounts. Yeah, they have some updates. And and that's sort of like why I got frustrated and I left because I couldn't add like little, like I just wanted to add like, oh, say I wanted to pay off this thousand dollar thing or something. I would want to put it in there. And it was like, you had to like make it an auto loan or something like that. Yeah, and it's the same thing with their goals. Um, you can't like with goals, you know, I've got goals for, I want to save X amount of money for a down payment on a house or, you know, I want to save X amount of money. And with goals, you have to associate it with like an actual account for it to like see the money rising. You can't link it to everything. And so sometimes there is some manual work that has to happen in there. And I do hope that they make some improvements there. That is that it is not perfect. Um, But as far as like a, you know, starter space or like some of the the main things that need to happen for you to get control over your finances, I, I still think it's a good tool. But personal finance is also great. And there's other ones too, like some people use, you need a budget, YNAB. Um, that's a paid service. I haven't used it, but um, apparently it's excellent. So there, there's a few ways. Some people do budget trackers just like in their, on their own, if they're really great at spreadsheets and they're, and they're detail oriented, you just have to be very on top of it. So there's a lot of different ways to go about it. But Mint, I think for a beginner, it's like really easy. Oh, hundred percent. So encouragement to our patron who's been using it for two weeks. Keep going, keep going. <laughs> Totally worth it. And there's not a perfect one out there. Yeah, exactly. Interrupting the interview to mention our partnership with Ayrton at this year's LDI conference. We are hosting a panel of lighting designers discussing the finances of freelance careers. The panel is made up of architainment and controls designer Amy D. Lux, Broadway designer Jen Schriever, and lighting guru Marsha Stern. Now this year, Ayrton is sponsoring Women in Lighting's entertainment division, The Women in Entertainment Lighting session will be in the afternoon following our live recording. That's going to be at 3.30 p.m. and I'll be there myself. Now afterwards, there is a happy hour sponsored by Ayrton, so we'll have time to hang out and say hello. We've coordinated all of this with Linnea. She sent us this message. Ayrton design and manufacture innovative LED and laser source moving lights for indoor and outdoor applications in concert touring, theater, studio, installation, and architecture. Ayrton is a proud sponsor of the international support and networking project Women in Lighting. Ayrton's primary aim is to raise awareness of and expand the network across the entertainment lighting industry. Go to womeninlighting.com and sign up for the entertainment newsletter to learn more. Male supporters are welcome. Ayrton is exclusively distributed by Act Entertainment in North America. And now, back to the show. 
Okay, and then also you had mentioned um, Acorns. That's like a company I've heard of before. That was in one of your um, articles. How did you use that? Or what is that and how did you use it? Yeah, so Acorns is um, actually, it was that in those early in 2018, like that was that was one of my first investment vehicles. With a lot of investments, especially if you don't know what you're doing yet, sometimes you have to have a minimum amount and that amount may be more than you have. And what, what's nice about Acorns, it's again, another great like beginner product is that you can uh, link it to any credit card or debit card and it'll round up your pennies. So like every time I go buy a coffee and it's 276, it's going to put that extra 24 cents right into my investment account. So every time I swipe my credit card, it just automatically takes those pennies and puts them into the investment account. And then you can allocate it based on like how aggressive you want it to be investing. So that's what I did at first. I just like let it uh, automate for me just on roundups. And then as I was able to start saving more and because I was spending less because I was looking at my budgets, then I was like, okay, I'm going to add 20 bucks a month to it. Now I'm going to add 50 bucks a month to it. Um, eventually, you know, it just, it's kind of like a savings account, but it's investing. So it's building compound interest at the same time. I eventually did move away from Acorns after a few years because uh, once I learned more about index funds and Vanguard and VTSAX and, you know, the vehicles that I want to use that are aligned with the fire movement, Acorns was no longer, you know, I had enough savings to do these kind of minimum investments and things like that. So I did end up pivoting, but Acorns is really, really good in the beginning when you're trying to understand the language, you don't want to screw anything up. It's hard to screw up with Acorns. You really... You're not going to make the wrong. It's easy. Like I'll say as an example, it's easy to screw up on Robinhood because Robinhood has futures and like all these really complicated things. And it makes it almost a little too easy for a novice to to get themselves in trouble. But you're not going to get yourself in trouble with Acorns. It's it's a very solid platform for a beginner. And then, of course, at some point we can talk about what I what I think everybody should aspire to for their investment strategy, but Acorns is an excellent beginner platform. Yeah, I've, I've never done it, but I, I definitely like the idea. Now also, Metro cards are phased out of New York City. So you pay with your phone, and it's 275 every time. And if you take the subway twice in a day, that's 50 cents every day you're gonna... Yeah. And it's like people don't notice 50 cents disappearing. You might drop a quarter when we used to carry cash. But, you know, like, I mean, it's the kind of thing where it really adds up and people don't, you don't miss it. You don't miss it. And also, you've mentioned compound interest a couple times already. Everybody can just Google that and your your mind will be blown. Episode 53 of our show, we had Patty Hirsch on talking about compound interest and all that. So if you're interested, go back to episode 53 and find it. And also, just because I get distracted very easily, you said we can talk about what everybody you think everybody should be using as their investment vehicle. Can we do that now so that I don't have to remember? (laughs) Yeah. So finally, after a few years of, you know, educating myself and improving my financial IQ and, you know, learning what all these words and things mean, Um, now my main strategy is index funds, uh, real estate can be a part of it as well, but we'll just focus on index funds. So I know the stock market is a really scary place. It definitely was for me. And again, I, all of my information comes back to the fire movement or the fire strategy, uh, in index funds are incredibly safe because basically most people I'll use S and P 500 as an example, because most people, even if they know nothing about stock investments, they, have probably heard of the S&P 500. And so basically what that is, it is it is an index, meaning it is a combination of 500 of basically the strongest stocks in the US. And what makes a stock is just, it's a piece of a company. Basically Google's in there, Apple's in there, Tesla's in there. It is a combination of every stock of the top stocks. What happens with index funds, and there's other index funds besides the S&P 500, But what happens with index funds is that if if a company fails, it gets removed from the index and it gets replaced by a business that is succeeding. So therefore, the index itself is basically always safe because there's always successful businesses inside the index. So when you invest in the index fund, as opposed to buying Apple and buying Tesla individually, they're going to fluctuate a lot and you really don't have any control over that. 
then if you buy the index fund instead, where you've got the combination of all of them, you don't really have to worry about it because again, if a company fails, it's going to be removed and a company that is succeeding is going to replace it. So historically, it has always gone up. It always has had high returns. And that is kind of the basis of the FIRE strategy is to invest in index funds. I love this because I didn't realize your FIRE connection. And I've actually had listeners say, oh, can you do an episode on somebody that's in the FIRE community? And look, here we're doing it. (laughs) (laughs) I also didn't know that index funds was sort of not a a tenant of the belief, (laughs) but a a thing with FIRE. Um, Because when I think FIRE, I always think like extremists, but index funds are the like opposite of extreme. Actually, FIRE is a very safe, it's a very safe strategy. It's more of a set it and forget it. Like, I know this is going to work again. Like I said, there's, there's real estate, there's, there's other options, but it, the a large majority of it is index funds. And we love Vanguard because Vanguard's member owned. This is not sponsored. I'm not sponsored, but Vanguard's member owned. And actually, uh, Jack Bogle, who's the founder of Vanguard, uh, basically created index funds and he wanted people to have accessibility and there wasn't. And by creating the index fund, it created accessibility for people to um, to be able to succeed within the market. With Va- so with Vanguard being member owned, uh, it means that basically the the fees are much lower. So there's always going to be some fee when you buy into this into the market. But with Vanguard being member owned, the fees are very 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 low. Very you know you don't even notice. And these are the kinds of things that you can do. Without a financial advisor, a financial advisor is going to take most of your money, even though it always only sounds like two or three percent. They're going to be taking most of your money. And if you just buy, for example, VTSAX, the index fund that is all encapsulating, you've got you've got everything in there. You can buy it through Vanguard directly. You don't need any help with that. You, It's a long game. You leave it in there as long. Right now, it, the market is down. We're going to a recession. Everyone's freaking out. This is the perfect time to not remove your money. Leave the money in there. It's going to come back. And actually, most people in FIRE community are buying now because the stock market is the only store where when there's a sale, people don't buy stuff. The market downturning is it's an opportunity for a sale. Everything's cheaper. So buy more now and leave it in there for 20 years. And then you're you're going to have millions of dollars. I uh, love everything about what you're saying. <laughs> That's an oversimplification. It depends on how much you might put in there to no, get a million. No, absolutely. But- we deliver hard-hitting facts on this program. Amy just said, put your money in the next funds in a couple years, you'll have a million dollars. Seven cents and you're a millionaire. <laughs> so it's been written, let it happen. <laughs> I mean, but here's the deal. You could at least try. Even if it's not 100% accurate, you give it a shot. <laughs> okay, so... Then you had also written about something called uh, Debt Avalanche. And I'm just wondering if you can explain that. It was hashtag Debt Avalanche. Yes. So this, there's, they're two different, they're opposite strategies. So the snowball strategy is that you pay off your largest debt first, like your the largest amount, and then you tackle the next one, the next lower one, and you keep going. The issue with that strategy is that it doesn't take into account the interest rates. So the avalanche, the debt avalanche is that you pay off instead of paying the one with the largest balance, you pay off the one with the highest interest rate. So again, it comes back to that compound interest. But in this case, compound interest is working against you because the higher interest that you have on a loan or on any debt, it's going to mean that your 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 balance is being charged based on that interest rate. So they're making that money off of you. My strategy and many people believe that you want to pay off the avalanche strategy where you're paying off the highest interest rate first because that way you're in the long run you're oh, you're paying less you're paying less money to your debtors. Yeah, so I think that's logically and financially the best choice is the debt avalanche. I think the snowball is for the psychological reasons of seeing yourself paying it off faster. Ethan will say this, there is no wrong way. Correct. Because it's the same. Uh, it's the same with investing. In my humble opinion, say you're 20 years old and you put it all into really conservative bonds. Yeah, you could say that's wrong, but also like you're investing and you're saving. So <laughs> yeah, and you have to be comfortable. I mean, at the end of the day, there is an emotional responsibility. I think that isn't talked about with financial podcasts or financial articles. You have to be comfortable with what you're doing. If you, you know, you've got to, you've got to make it work for your life because otherwise you will not find success. If you're stressed out and you're not sure, 
you really have to be comfortable with your strategy. And also this ties into our investing special, our artistic finance 6K, which I'm hoping, Amy, that you will join our next one. But moral of the story is I picked some investments because I was like, if the average Joe, Ethan, can do this, you know, then everybody can do it. Well, let me tell you, Amy, I chose all the wrong things. I did everything wrong. <laughs> but you know what? It's totally fine. Like, I'm not negative so far. So that's just the thing of like, yeah, you got to do what's right for you. But you have to do something. That's the most important thing is to be doing something. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Also, okay, you also, in one of your posts, you talk about how you have to take care of yourself or you have to fill up your own cup um, to be able to have your cup overflow and give it to other people, aka giving to charity, etc. So can you just talk about that and how that worked with you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier about just giving too much of yourself to one thing and, and not having balance. And so, you know, if we if we aren't taking care of ourselves, it, it may not manifest right away, but eventually it does implode. It's no different with finance or, or anything else. Um, you've got to make sure that you're taken care of and then you can help others. And honestly, one of those earlier, we were talking about how my mindset shift happened. Uh, one of the things that, that happened was that uh, I was in a household where we were, you know, a lot of anarchists and things, and we just didn't want to, um, you know, turn the heat on because we'd be paying the man and, you know, that kind of thing. And it was so cold. And I was under like 17 blankets just trying to get warm. And every time I came out, my nose would freeze and pop under the blanket again. I was just you know, I couldn't even get out of bed and like do anything. I was just frozen. And I realized that I wasn't hurting the man and the man was fine. And I was not fine. And that I didn't have, you know, enough to give of myself and to give back. That was kind of when I realized that I just I wanted to have enough to share and I wanted to have enough to be okay, but also to be able to help others. You know, I didn't want to be a sellout. I was an artist. I didn't want to be a sellout and be like looking for, you know, getting money. It just, there's this whole association um, that it's, that it's bad and convenience is the enemy and all of these things, but money is a tool. It has the energy that you put on it. It, it is not, it is not a living breathing thing. It is, it has the energy. And I, I just realized that I can use it for good and I don't have to become corrupt and evil and greedy that I could just make it be comfortable, give it away you know, and, and now I give to charities all the time. I have a regular membership with the ACLU. I have a regular membership with the NAACP. I give to local charities. I give to friends. Um, it's just a lot easier now because I'm not constantly struggling wearing when I'm going to get my next meal because I have prioritized financial independence in my life. I think that there is a, a lot of misnomers and miseducation around if I pursue money, I'm a bad person especially if I'm a creative. And it's just not true. The, we cannot take care of each other or our communities if we aren't taking care of ourselves financially as well. And again, one of the reasons why this show exists is so that like, we can talk about it without you know, being hush-hush or it being taboo. Because it's like, we all have to eat. We all need to talk about this. And there's, there's artists who make a lot of money and there's artists who don't make a lot of money. What is the difference? Plus, it's like if you're if you're a nice person without money, you're going to be a nice person with money. The money is not the issue there. <laughs> I don't want to age you, but you may be self-described as a late bloomer when it came to the financial picture. So can you just talk about how, how that happened? We, okay, so we have some listeners who are late bloomers. I know this for a fact. <laughs> and I'm trying to give them encouragement. For. No, I don't want to get too specific here. <laughs> I love getting specific, but I don't want it too much. So let's use the age of 50, random number, some human being somewhere in the world. When you did your 180, say there's somebody who's 50 and wants to do the 180. What can you sort of tell them, I don't know, as encouragement? Well, absolutely. It is definitely not too late. Absolutely not too late. And the FIRE movement specifically, most of the people that I follow in that space, and I am on track to do similarly, five to 15 years that they have been able to become financially independent to the point where they can, and there's different ways to do it, but five to 15 years when you fire, follow the FIRE strategy is typically 
the amount of time that people are able to turn their lives around and save enough for retirement. Part of it is understanding that budget and understanding what your annual spending is. And then there's formulas. There's simple math formulas where it will tell you exactly if you save this amount of money and you spend this amount of money, it's going to take you X amount of time to retire. If you buy into index funds or buy into real estate, these are very simple math, math formulas. Anybody can do it. It just takes a little bit of discipline and a little bit of education, but it is by no means out of reach. Amy, dropping the knowledge on us, I have never heard that five to 15 year time estimate. I get, I get information from the fire community, but I guess I don't partake. <laughs> I, you know, I've read a lot of stories um, from fire people that have fired from all different walks of life. I mean, it's not just engineers and high earners, it's teachers and, you know, there, there's all kinds of people with all different kinds of incomes uh, that have been able to, to do this. Okay, now uh, credit scores, because you wrote about credit scores. So we've done a couple episodes on credit cards and credit scores. I'm of the opinion, like, I don't care about my credit score. Like, I guess I would care if I needed it to get me something. But so far in my life, I've never needed it, as far as I know. You have a story about how you improved your credit score. So I'm wondering if you can tell us how you did that. And also, does it even matter? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when I was younger, I thought it didn't matter either. And again, I was a, I was a pretty strong anarchist and, you know, you know, was very negative about money and institutions and, you know, I it's funny cuz now I'm using my graphic design degree finally, but I wasn't for a long time and I was like, I'm not even using my degree. Like, why should I pay off my school loans and I I defaulted and I I was quite the rebel. <laughs> and I ignored I ignored my school loans. I ignored them for a very long time. And my credit score was something around like 386 or something really low. And I was like, I don't care. I'm never going to buy a house. I'm never going to buy a car on credit. Like, I don't need a credit score. And then one day I did. Like, one day I needed something. <laughs> um, and it's actually... It's, it's not even as you don't necessarily need it to buy a house or buy a big ticket item. Nowadays, you actually need it to get your utility bill turned on in a lot of places. The, and it's not that they won't give you utilities because obviously everyone has to have utilities, but they'll charge you um, if you have a low credit score, they will charge you uh, a deposit. In other situations, you'll have to pay more back, you know, um, so Having a low credit score is really detrimental to you, especially if you are in a debt cycle. People that have low income, um, and let's just say that, you know, we know this is disproportionately people of color and women. This is a way to keep people down and to keep those power structures in place. Because if you have a low credit score and low income, and we're going to charge you um, to get your utilities turned on and we're going to charge you late fees. And then you just get in the cycle of not being able to pay and not being able to get ahead. And then you're always behind. You're, you're getting charged more because now you have to pay late fees every time and you have to pay these extravagant fees. Or uh, if you have to go to a check cashing place because you don't have the ability to get a bank account, which is true in some places, especially in rural areas, you know, there, there, it is not as easy as, you know, some of us in the, you know, the New Yorks and the San Francisco's think that it is, this does disproportionately affect people of color and women and low earners. And there are a lot of obstacles in place. So just because you don't want to buy a house, which is perfectly fine choice, doesn't mean that your, your low credit score isn't going to affect you. I kind of just got tired of being charged a lot of fees when I was very poor. So I decided to rehab my school loan, which was the main reason why my credit score was so low. Uh, I just did that by starting with automating the minimum. Now, I am an advocate to pay as much as you can, especially on those high interest rates. Um, but if you don't have it, pay the minimum and have it automated so that you're never late so that you don't hit a late fee. You can have $8,000 on your credit card. If your minimum is $25, make it that it pays $25 on the first of the month automatically without you having to pay attention to the calendar and do it manually. That was the first step I did was to automate things. 
There are, like I mentioned, rehab programs. So with my school loans, I called them. They put me into a rehab program, which meant that in my case, it was I had to pay, you know, on time, the certain amount every month for I think it was like 18 months or something like that. So you can also, you know, do a rehab program. You can consolidate loans if you have several or consolidate debt if you have several different sources of debt. But it's basically paying it on time, at least the minimum every month. And the other major component of that is the debt ratio. You know, how much of your debt is above your the amount of credit that you have, your debt to credit ratio. So most uh, lenders or most uh, banking entities are not going to want to see more than 30% spending. So if you can get your debt to credit ratio below 30% of what your credit allowance is, uh, that is also very helpful. And if you can get that closer to zero, that is very helpful. So it actually... Does does that mean like if you have a credit card where you can spend $10,000 on it and you have debt of 3,000, like you have $3,000 in student loans left like that's the perfect ratio um so yeah i mean it's a combination of all of your debt so if you have student loans and you have a credit card and let's say your total um credit between the both of them is we'll say one hundred fifty thousand, you want to have less than 30 percent of one hundred fifty thousand owed let me simplify it so if your if your credit card debt is ten thousand dollars you want to owe less than $3,000. That means you have $7,000 of available credit on that credit card. So if you owe $4,000 or you owe $7,000 on your $10,000 credit card, then you're using 70% of your allowance of your credit ceiling. And then that, that looks very poorly and that will give you a lower score because you're, they're considering that not using your credit responsibly. Okay, so you also have a book club because you had in 2021, I think you had a bunch of books you were going to read. This year. It was this year. Okay, so this year you have a list of financial books you were going to read. And I'm just curious, it's October now. How are you doing on this reading list? Yeah, so this is the part where we talk about how it's okay to fail and to get back on your horse, because I actually fell behind. <laughs> um, I'm, I read up through May, and then the summer went a little nuts. I was building the van. Um, I was transitioning out of my job. I was transitioning out of my condo. And uh, yeah, there's just a lot going on. So um, so I fell off the wagon a little bit this summer, but I actually have a lot of flight dates coming up over the next two months. And I have every intention of catching up. I'm very goal oriented. So I love to have goals. And so I put this list together um, at the beginning of the year as part of my New Year's goals, um, which I, I like to call New Year's goals instead of resolutions. And then I, I, I do like a quarterly check to make sure I'm still on track with my goals. If I'm not, then I take a moment to reevaluate, like, is this still important to me? Do I need to pivot? If it is, how do I get back on track? So my plan to, to get caught up is I have a lot of long flights over the next two months and I'm going to get them on audiobook and I'm going to get all caught up. But these are all influencers in the fire space. And some of them, I follow their blogs or YouTube videos. And I, and I know I know all of these authors and they're very um, well known for these strategies. And again, I love when the strategies overlap and it kind of reinforces that knowledge, but sometimes there's lots of new nuggets in there as well. So everything that I've read, even if it's something that I already feel comfortable and understand, um, it just reinforces and reinvigorates that concept. And I definitely recommend this reading list to anybody who's interested in um, you know, increasing their financial IQ and kind of uh, especially for the late bloomers, if you know, or anybody that feels behind, it, this is not something, you know, we put a lot of attention to the youth and, and it is excellent. If you can start young in these strategies, you will be able to retire so early. There's so many of these fire people that did start early and, you know, they're retired by 30 and, and retire, you know, just to be clear, doesn't mean that you, you don't have to do anything. And you're just sitting on a beach with a pina colada, although, you can if you want to, but it's it just it's more of a freedom of doing uh, what you want to do. Like for me, when I when I when I reach fire, uh, I want to be able to work on, you know, more productions that I can't really afford to do right now. You know, I, I do work in a lot of corporate 
Um, and I and I work in higher paying gigs now because I didn't when I was a freelancer. I was a late bloomer, so I'm making up for lost time. And I'm I am chasing the dollar a little bit right now. You know, I'm I'm trying to save as much as possible and and make myself you know make my future okay. Well, I was actually I was going to ask you of the books that you have read this year on that list. Um, do you have a favorite? I think that I would say the simple path to wealth. The simple path to wealth is definitely one of the most popular ones in the fire space. It literally shows you how simple it can be. I also love your money of your or your life because it helps to contextualize how we're spending our time. And she breaks it down, Vicki Robbins, every hour that you work equals it's not just your salary. It's how much do I spend on work attire and tools and my commute and how much, you know, how much time does my commute add to my day? And when you start adding up all of the time that you are investing into your wherever you're making your money, your hourly goes way down. A lot of people don't consider all of these things. So it's very enlightening to realize we're not even being compensated what we think we're being compensated once we start taking in all these other expenses that we're not, that most people don't really consider. Okay, so I have, uh, we've already talked for 90 minutes. Thank you so much for giving me all this time. Last question for you. Where can people connect with you? Yeah, um, I mean, I love everyone. So anyone can connect with me. But uh, my my website, I just updated my website, loboluxdesign.com. And then that actually on the front page connects to all my socials. So Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, so loboluxdesign.com. Loboluxdesign.com. So that's that's my lighting. And then the lifestyle stuff is utopiadreamscape.com. Same thing for all the socials. Utopia Dreamscape is the name on Instagram, Facebook, all of that. Amy, thank you so much for, one, giving us all this time, and two, saying so many good things. And then LDI, one last time. We'll all see you at 3.30 p.m., at LDI for the Women in Lighting um, thingamook Bob with a happy hour afterwards sponsored by Ayrton. Yes. <laughs> that's, yes. that's also important. <laughs> um, and then we'll maybe see you at 1130 also on that same Friday. Absolutely. Yes. For the artistic finance recording. I'll be there. All right. Well, thank you, Amy. Thank you so much. <laughs> that's it for this week's episode. Did you enjoy the interview? Are you a member of the FIRE community? And do you agree with Amy? Do you have any questions? Please connect with Amy or me. And you can email me directly at artisticfinancepodcast at gmail.com. I do check all the emails and respond, and I would love to hear from you. If you're enjoying the show and you'd like to access our bonus content and early releases, please become a patron. You can pay monthly or once a year, and you can cancel anytime. Join up at patreon.com slash artistic finance. And if you aren't a patron, but you do want to help us out, there is a free fee that you can pay. That fee is to tell someone about the show. If you're too bashful to tell somebody about the show, you can also subscribe on any podcast app or YouTube, or you can leave a rating on Apple or Spotify. If you do take the time to help us out, thank you in advance. Now that's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Make sure to subscribe. To access our show notes, transcripts, or resources, go to artisticfinance.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decision, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Artistic Finance. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.